Thank you, Devon. To the national directors, the guests and delegates at the convention, you can't please everyone. I talked with a young couple outside the door when I came in, and Kentucky isn't going to like this. But as I sat here, I could see the smoke and the lights. And they said, would somebody please announce to hold the smoking down? That may not be popular with Kentucky, but uh, I know the other people would appreciate it. I always feel when I come to a national convention, the same as I feel if I'm talking with one person, a county meeting or a state convention, really the way I look at it is, this is the culmination of all the county meetings that we hold. And there's always one question that's asked to me more than anyone else, or any other question. How is the NFL going? I'll have to recap some of the things that have been said here today, but I hope I can make you proud of your organization. Jim Ross is not the first one that I've heard speak of the news, from the news media who has almost made the same comparison, the growing up of the National Farmers Organization. It came to me by a man who interviewed me in the office less than six months ago from the Associated Press. And at the end of the interview, he said, has the NFO become of age? And I said, yes, we have. And today, in the time that I'll take here, I hope to prove that to you. Being right, you can never be defeated. And you are right, and you will not be defeated. There's so little time that I have to talk with the people and sit down and visit with the people that it's a pleasure for me to do it here. And I've said that at every state convention that I've gone to this year. What can I do can help you the most? What can I do for an individual or the county meetings or the state or the national convention? I even called a meeting of all the department directors before I went to any state conventions. I called one young lady in the department that handles the membership and said, what can I do to help the most, to bring us together and to keep the organization growing so we can function properly? Because there's only one thing that has kept farmers divided now, and that's the lack of communication. If we could be in one room together and our production would be here, tomorrow morning we'd put a price on it, wouldn't we? I always say then when I go to these uh, meetings, uh, you look for somebody with a lot of intelligence. I carry an intelligence report with me. I heard Devon show you an article or a magazine the other day that said we're behind the times. I don't like to see that, so I carry what says intelligence with me. This is a bulletin that is put out weekly to keep you informed. So I quote, the upshot, prices appear to be at a turning point. If rallies cannot develop this week, a very sharp sell-off should be expected. Prices for soybeans, corn, and wheat could recover late this year or early next year, but this cannot be counted on. From an intelligence report. Didn't come out of the NFO office either. Let me point out a few things to make a point of what has been happening. There's not many of you fly the Allegheny Airlines, and I don't very often, but in their publication they had an article, The Fastest Game in Town. 
It covers every commodity that you produce. And the top line says playing the commodities game is noisy, difficult, and sometimes risky. But it's all part of keeping food going to town and the prices down. And I ask you who they keep the prices down on. It's you and I. Has anything changed in the last five or ten years as far as help from anyone but yourselves? On February 20th, 1975, Kenneth Frick from the Department of Agriculture, a department that we believed and we thought was for the betterment of agriculture and to help farmers, made the statement that a few farmers going broke is healthy. In 1983, the same report came from the same department from the Secretary of Agriculture who, I, who said, and I quote from this article, agriculture is a dynamic changing industry. I think we can expect change. American agriculture has remained efficient only because the least efficient farmers regularly, and I repeat regularly, are forced, forced off the land. Only now they've got more blatant. They've picked the farmers that they intend to force off the land. The income group and the numbers that they intend to retire. And you heard that figure before, 16% of the farmers. Now how do they do this? Jim Ross and some of the people talked about how the consumer ought to understand the good life they have because of you. Are you getting support? The Wall Street Journal, November 10th of this year. Let me quote or read what they said. When the indirect benefits ranging from low interest loans for rural utilities to taxpayer financing for farm research are included, the overall farm subsidies in fiscal 1983 totaled a staggering $54 billion. The Office of Management and Budget Estimates. Budget Director David Stockman notes that there were more, that was more than the U.S. spent to help the entire poverty population of this country. You remember, as I said a year ago, I believe it's too late to educate the consumer. I wish they could be, but with that type of material going out, how do you do it? First of all, in counteracting that, why don't they print the facts? The facts are that you have subsidized the consumer at least $220 billion. <laughs> we all know what we've been going through. 1982, uh, 1982 was worse than 1932. <coughs> Those are the facts. July of 1983 was the worst year and worst month recorded in history for the American farmer. The government people know that, and you and I have to put up with it. Every place I go, there's an interest in the dairy lawsuit. Let me make this statement to you. You and I are very lucky to still be together in a convention. You don't know the opposition you had. I'm going to recap it shortly, and I too may step on some toes. Did you know that when that lawsuit was brought against you, you were not fighting only one group? Did you know that you were fighting the universities of this United States? There were publications coming out from universities that should shock you. Here's one from the University of Ohio. 
that came out with statements attempting to destroy you. From the Cooperative Extension Service, the Ohio State University, March 1973. In part, and I quote from the article, in part, this question has been put before the federal court in Kansas City and as a way to handle a rump group, that's you, the Secretary of the State of Ohio should be forced to question the NFO's right to do business in Ohio. One of the things the NFO needs most right now is a real good lawsuit. Any rump group will usually be found short of funds, and any defense or action against them that forces the use and expenditure of money is a good way to deal with them. Then invest in the discovery period of that lawsuit where there was a very intent move to destroy you, digging through the files. We found in the cooperative files the same thing, asking to have fought lawsuits filed against the NFO because this move will probably break NFO's back because NFO cannot pay their present attorneys. It was at the same time that the publicity was coming out of the state of New York and the eastern areas. In the Derry News letter of February 3rd, 1978, I want you to realize what type of leadership we've had by the other groups. And this is from a quote from Louis P. Longo, Yankee Milk President. And I quote, frankly, dairy farmers are getting a hell of a lot more out of their product than they deserve, he said. And that's the type of leadership that the farmers have been given for years. So it's no wonder that we've been in trouble. And then I remember the publicity that hit every paper that I could see in the dairy producing areas of the country when I was director of the dairy department, saying that you were to blame, that this lawsuit, lawsuit should be dropped, that we were the cause of spending the money. For the record, which is available to every one of you, I want to quote from a document and pay tribute to a man that I hope is here today who was your general counsel, Lee Sinclair. The discussion, this is a testimony on March 6, 1978, transcript page 7640. The discussion related to the fact that this litigation was ongoing and it was a struggle between and among farm organizations. Mr. Russell, and Mr. Russell was one of the first attorneys to handle the case that we talked about to break the back of the NFO, said in substance that he really hated to have to bring another case, referring to the state court case that AMPI had brought against the NFO in the state of Wisconsin. But as long as this battle was going on, AMPI was going to hit NFO every place they could and as hard as they could, and ref he referred to suing them and to taking action with the government. He didn't say state or federal, just government. Mr. Sinclair responded by saying, in effect, isn't there some way we could work this out? Isn't there some way we could resolve this dispute? And Mr. Russell said, the only way this can be resolved is for NFO to get out of the milk marketing and business and leave it to the co-ops. With that kind of publicity, is it any wonder? Is it any wonder that when I attempted to encourage a young man to help you and I from the state of Wisconsin, Norbert Connors, that the results were that you'll hear in a minute? 
Norbert Connors grew up on a dirt, uh, farm close to me, was educated and taught school. He wasn't satisfied with his life and the type of salary that he was being paid. As we know, the teachers were underpaid. So he went for the lending agency, Production Credit Association, PCA. And I talked with Norbert Connors about the situation that I could see developing in agriculture at that time. He totally agreed with me. He said, I see farmers today going deeper in debt and deeper in debt, and eventually they're going to lose what they have unless it's turned around. So he encouraged farmers to join the National Farmers Organization as the manager of the PCA office. Guess what happened to him? He got fired. Has NFO come of age? Green County, Wisconsin. The Monroe branch manager of the PCA in an article, Forward Cash Contracts Available for Farmers in Green County, sent to all of their borrowers a letter showing them how to participate in the National Farmers Organization program. <laughs> I remember when I hoped I could see something good about the National Farmers Organization in the papers when I first was encouraging farmers to join. How do we get the publicity out? I hoped for anything good. Well, Jan June 11th, 1982, President Devon Woodland received a letter from the Big Farmer magazine, from the Big Farmer magazine, which said this, to better inform our readers of your efforts, I'm inviting you to pen an article for our magazine. Big Farm Entrepreneur is sent to 200,000 Class I farmers across the United States. The article might pertain to the following as well as additional topics. Problems currently confronting the U.S. agriculture, how your organization is combating them, your organization's goals, and you're attempting to achieve your goals and how farmers can join your organization. I would like to publish the article in September, which implies a July 21 deadline. Please limit the length to four or five typewritten pages. That's why I'd hope to see, and you've got it. Have we become of age? Devon Woodland said that, and you heard him, and it was mentioned again, his goals were to bring farm organizations together, and I heard you applause. I heard Jim Ross say the same thing, and I heard you applause. Well, let me tell you a little story that happened to me, <coughs> and this relates to when Walt Hackney did make the statement on the number of pigs we were going to have in this country. And what was going to happen to the price? And he encouraged a sell-off. And the president of the National Pork Producers Council and some of those objected to what the National Farmers Organization had said. I've told the people that through your national directors, the information that we have in our communication system were more accurate even that the gover than the government's records because sometimes I get the feeling you don't tell the government quite the truth. <laughs> but we do have the facts. And we go by your facts. And Walt H Hackney hit it right on the nose, the amount of pork <coughs> pigs that would be farrowed. When a report came out verifying that, it just happened I got the call from the president of the pro uh, pork producers Council, and I would hope that he would appreciate what I'm going to say because I compliment him. When he said, you were right. We don't know how you were that right, but you knew exactly. And he said, 
They were sorry and he apologized for things that had been said. My comment is, you know, we ought to be working together. And he said, you're right. He said, we should get together. We should sit down and talk together about how we can work these problems out. That's when the shocker came to me and 15 minutes later, he said, would it be all right with you if I sent you a letter that I intend to send to all of our producers and see if you feel it's the right thing to say? Now, do you believe that the NFO is becoming of age when they'll call the home office from other organizations and asking if they think it's all right? And do you believe I'm telling you the truth? There's the letter addressed to me, and it says on there, unedited version, for your use, this is how I'm using it, to show you that they are coming to the NFO. He yelled, yes. <laughs> he sent me the four by the pork four program. He said, what we're going to advocate is to encourage our producers to sell 10% of their sows and sell 10% lighter. We had advocated 10% or 8% of the sows and 10 pounds lighter. All that says to me that they finally understand, and I compliment them for their leader to take that stand, that you know the benefit of a supply management program because that's what it is. Figures on that could be gone through month by month. Was it successful? On August 4th, 1982, federally inspected slaughter showed that 3.9% of the sows were being slaughtered. On August 4th, 1983, 6.5%. Supply management in action we can do it just as well as anyone else in the industry that said farmers cannot control supply. Who else is beginning to come forward? It was to my surprise that Gene Paul from the state of Minnesota gave me an article by Cy, Cy Carpenter suggesting that the farmers union in that area support this sell-off. I used it at the Nebraska State Convention. Somebody came up immediately and said, can I have that article? And I said, no, it's the only one I got. And he said, well, the Farmers Union press state president is here and he'd like it. I said, go ahead, take it. <laughs> I've talked with people around the entire United States where that organization and others are coming and talking with and sitting on the platform with the National Farmers Organization. If, you need to men if I need to mention some of you, I know the state of Kansas has come to me with a report. I know that the state of Iowa has come with that report. I know that today that Chuck Frazier, your legislative representative, heads that and is a, the man they look to in the coalition. And in the Minot, North Dakota, the Farmers Union state president said, we consider your man Chuck Frazier, the Dean of Legislative Representation in the United States. And Jim Ross just pointed out the same thing. <laughs> A man from the Farmers Union of the State of Iowa called me. And it happened, this is what he said. It happened that Former Secretary of Agriculture Butts was going to speak at Ames. He said, we're not going. <laughs> but he said, I'll tell you, we're going to write a letter and tell them we're not coming for various reasons. But he said, we want to check with you first because he, don't, he said, we don't want to hurt anything that the NFO is doing. Now this is happening and NFO has become of age. Now I want to make this point. I sat down with the president of the Durham growers in Minot and had lunch with him because the NFO representative said, would you talk with him? And he himself said, we ought to be working together 
we would like to have you come and talk with the people. And that's when I said, as I believe you and Devon has always said, there's no need to quarrel with those groups, and there's no need for those groups to quarrel with us, because they work on promotion and research, and we need it. We work on collective bargaining, and they need it. And that's when this organization will be of age, when Devon Woodland holds that press conference. Because those people across the entire nation are going to see this. They'll see it on, they'll read about it and see it on television. And that's what you and I have better worked for, and we have worked for, and we've come of age today. In spite of what the opposition said when they'd break our back, you know that you've had that growth in dairy. You know that you've had that growth in, in grain. You know that there's coming growth in meat like you will never expect to see today, but you will see it in the coming years, in the year, in the, 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 this next year, because of these groups. They want collective bargaining just as well as you do. <laughs> Let me tell you some of the things, yet I think Jim told all the stories that have to be told, so I won't go into many of those. But this Associated Press man said to me, we've tried to help you. Now, I don't know if they have or not. But he said, we have, but he said, I wanted to give you an example of what happens. I released on the wire service on your sow sell-off. And he said, I got a telephone call back from New York. And the man on the other end of the line with Associated Press said, who buys these sows? <laughs> you remember the gal that interviewed me last year and said the guy in the radio station in Boston thought the that the goose was the male and the duck was the female? <laughs> you heard about Walt being asked to, to help Gene Fattrell, one of the top economists in the nation? Got the same request from a gentleman in Missouri? You know his answer was that the NFO is right and you've missed it for so many years, we really can't be associated with you? Devon was off on his uh, figure the other day a little bit. He's conservative. That market-to-market -market is viewed in 31 states, and the National Farmers Organization and Collective Bargaining is headed right on top of that. You want publicity and you don't think you've become of age? Let me give you another one. There's a proposal of a world agricultural center building to be put up in the United States. It will not only have American agriculture represented, but foreign agriculture. It's a tremendous place. Who do you think has been asked to come and have their headquarters in that building in the biggest agricultural state in the nation, the National Farmers Organization? You, you think you haven't become of age? When the survey was taken to find out, because I've always wondered, why aren't farmers flocking to the National Farmers Organization? They need and they want what we have. Well, the survey pretty well pointed that out. And I want to close to keep, in the next issue, of who's who in America, your president, Devon Woodland, has just been entered into that group in who's who in America. Thank you. <laughs>